Great. Oh, good uh, Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online, online event. Um, we are a webinar, we are a webcast, an online show. Uh, the terminology is up for debate, but whatever you want to call us, um, we are here live at, online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record the show every week, so you can always go to our website later and watch recordings of all of our shows. And at the end of today's session, I will show you um, where you can see all those recordings. We do a mixture of things here on the show, uh, book reviews, mini training sessions, interviews, demos sometimes, um, basically anything library related, we are happy to have it on the show. We are very broad with that. <laughs> um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do do presentations, um, for Nebraska things that we're doing here, but we also bring in guest speakers, and that's what we have um, this morning. Um, on the line with us um, from the organization Libraries Without Borders, which you'll hear more about in the second here, is um, Paloma Prader and Kimmy Ross. Good morning, guys. Morning. Good morning. Um, and they are both from the organization the Libraries Without Borders, a uh, nonprofit uh, non organization who's doing some great work with getting library um, support and programs and resources into places all over the world, both in the U.S. and internationally. So, um, but I'll just let them explain it a lot better <laughs> um, than I can. I'll just hand it over to you guys to take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Krista, for hosting us today. And thank you for everyone to join us today. Um, I am Paloma Prader, and I am a project officer at Libraries Without Borders. And I'm with my colleague, Kimmy Ross. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about our work, Libraries Without Borders, and how we're innovating access to information among the most under-resourced communities. So just before we dive straight into it, I wanted to go give you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be discussing today. Um, I'm going to be giving you a lot of background about uh, Libraries Without Borders, what we do, our history, and then I'm gonna, we're going to be talking about uh, our uh, first innovation, the Ideas Box, and how it's been implemented domestically and abroad. Then we're going to be discussing a little bit about the Coom Book, which is a second innovation uh, drawn from the Ideas Box. And then we'll give you a little bit of an overview of our strategy of implementation, how we plan our projects, and then we'll tell you about, about how we're, like, where we're headed next. So thank you so much for joining us, and we're really excited to get started. All right, so to understand Libraries Without Borders from a basic level, you need to understand our mission statement. So at Libraries Without Borders, we believe that libraries are not just connections of book, collectors of books, but connectivity hubs that empower economic and human development and provide people with the tools necessary to transform their lives. And this has really shaped all of the programs that we've undertaken domestically and abroad, as one of our focuses is economic development and international aid. So given our mission statement, we work to create and support 21st century libraries around the world and provide access to quality information and education to the most vulnerable populations. In addition, we believe that free access to information is a fundamental human right and we believe that education, innovation, co-creation, diversity, and lifelong learning are central to the, to the emancipation and development of human beings and their communities. So all of our programs, that, which currently span four continents and 27 countries, focus on these core values and beliefs. In addition, our programming revolves around three themes. Civic engagement, in which we uh, engage in efforts to support literacy rates, education, and community resilience, entrepreneurship, in which we support professional development, and humanitarian crises, in which we provide disaster relief and psychosocial healing specifically for refugees. Um, so these three themes, again, they target these specific areas and really help to build community resilience around education. So before diving straight into uh, our current projects, I wanted to give a little bit of context to uh, Libraries Without Borders and how we began. So we were founded in 2007 in France, and we actually began our work in Haiti. 
by supporting the Haiti University Network. In 2010, a 7.3 magnitude earthquake struck and the university asked us to stay because there was uh, such a huge impact on an already under-resourced community and there is also a huge impact on the uh, educational resources there. In fact, half of the country's population is under 18, meaning that the school-age children and families were those that were especially affected. And um, we've noticed that uh, in post-disaster context, education is simply not a priority. And we were able to see this firsthand in Haiti once the earthquake struck. About 4,000 schools were damaged and destroyed in an already extremely under-resourced context. So this had a really significant impact on Haiti and there was so little support uh, that we saw a huge opportunity to help support libraries and librarians and to increase access to information and education in these areas. Um, a huge amount of people lost their homes. They were forced to move to camps without adequate school resources. So in this context, we realize the huge potential of libraries and how we can reimagine library spaces to help populations such as these and to increase access to information and education and provide high quality education. Um, and so now from then we've been working uh, to innov uh, find innovating ways to access education information. And to this point today, we are in fact implemented in 27 countries, which uh, we're really proud about and we're really excited to uh, keeping the programs going and to expand to even more countries and continents. So on to the birth of the Ideas Box. The Ideas Box is our first innovation, our first tool created by Libraries Without Borders and it was created in 2013. We partnered with UNHT and Philip Stark to create an optimal design to provide uh, to increase the access to information and to education. It is an autonomous, portable, and customizable pop-up media center and mobile classroom that provides a variety of resources, uh, devices, um, and all sorts of resources for uh, all ages to, ac to access. Um, this has been spe specifically used in post-context, uh, post-disaster contexts, and this was actually first used in Burundi. So what is the Ideas Box? The Ideas Box is what is pictured here, and as you can see, it contains four modules, as well as two silver cases containing tables and furniture. Uh, the Ideas Box ships on two standard shipping pallets and is easily transportable, and the shell of the box is waterproof and unfolds to create furniture. Um, as you will see in a video that we're going to be showing you shortly, the box unfolds to create a 100 meter squared space which acts as a makeshift school and supporting, uh, supportive educational center. So we'd just like to show you a short video from the Ideas Box. As you can see, a team of four people is able to deconstruct the ideas box and assemble its necessary components. The yellow box that they're working in the foreground of the video here is the administration module, which is the backbone of the ideas box as it houses the network system and power system. The orange box over to the left hand of the screen there is the library module and contains up to 300 paperback books and a dozen board and video games, as well as stationery. The IT module in the back, which is the green box, contains 50 e-readers, 15 tablets, 5 laptops, and 5 HD cameras. And the cinema module, which is the blue one, also in the back right, houses an HD television perfect for screening video content. As you can see, the Ideas Box is really creating a physical learning space. It has furniture, tablets, computers, the cinema module, and paperback books, which really provides an innovative and interactive learning space for all program participants.
there you have it. That's the Ideas Box in a nutshell. So thank you for watching that with us. Uh, we hope you have a better idea of what the Ideas Box is and uh, a visual image of how easily it can be unfolded and unpacked within 20 minutes uh, with just a small team and create a 100 meter squared space um, with uh, educational resources, cultural resources, and a huge amount of information. So we want to discuss the goals of the Ideas Box. And before uh, we go on to that, I wanted uh, for all of you to take a quick guess about the average length of stay of a refugee in a refugee camp. And you can keep that in mind. If you want to write it in the dialogue box, that is encouraged. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, so I'll give you a few seconds to just think about the average length. Yep, everybody can go ahead and use the question section there to type in if you have any 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 clue, any inf any insight. <laughs> uh, first person says uh, five or more years. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Great. Great. Is that? Um, well, actually, the it, the average length of time for a refugee in a camp is 17 years, which is a wow. really significant amount, and much more than most people would first assume. Mm -hmm. And when we're thinking about that statistic, it's really important to think of children in particular. So if a child is born in a refugee camp or enters a refugee camp at the age of two or three years old, by the time 17 years is passed, their entire lifespan of education is gone as well. So within 17 years, most children will have completed elementary school, middle school, high school, and earn some, some sort of formal educational certificate attesting to the fact that they are able and ready to uh, participate in society, get a job, and kind of enter the workforce and become an adult. So when 17 years passes and refugee children do not have access to educational resources, they are really losing an entire lifetime of education, uh, which means that essentially we're losing losing an entire generation of children with today's uh, Syrian refugee crisis, given its magnitude, um, by the fact that they are not allowed access to information and educational resources. So when we created the Ideas Box, we wanted to make sure that these programs expand access to information, education, uh, to connectivity, and to create collaborative spaces in ways that can empower communities to design their own developmental solutions. And these, this is in all contexts and not necessarily just in refugee camps. Um, we believe that the Ideas Box is a really remarkable toolbox that uh, can empower children and adults alike to pave foundations for a, a self-reliant future and to help provide for themselves and become an independent. Uh, its design is it's mobile, it's robust, it has its own power source. So it can really provide a safe space for all generations, for all ages, uh, where creativity can flourish and for, uh, to help children and adults with their education, which they might not have access to. So we have four goals uh, with the Ideas Box. And firstly, it is to create a safe space. Um, especially in contexts such as refugee camps, uh, they can be extremely dangerous, especially to children. So not only ch can children go here to have access to all these sorts of resources, thousands of resources and activities that they can use and have fun with, uh, it can also help significantly reduce the risk of exposed children in refugee camps and provide that very, very safe space that for example, libraries would otherwise provide, which they will not, they do not have access to there. Our second goal is to strengthen community ties. Um, again, in post-disaster context, there can be a significant amount of community tensions and a lot of post-traumatic stress disorder. So the Ideas Box is very much an interactive space that can facilitate encounters between individuals and act as a catalyst for community bonds. We really aim to strengthen the peace and to provide the support for those who are experiencing 
post-traumatic stress disorder who are in shock and those who have just lost absolutely everything, including schools and access to information. In addition, the Ideas Box works to support educational efforts. So as we mentioned, a lot of refugee children don't have access to schools in the camps where they are living. And if they do, there are UNHCR um, makeshift schools, schools that aren't really supplied with the necessary resources uh, that are essential to children's education in an interactive manner. So the Ideas Box provides access to a wide range of content, including offline content, as the Ideas Box creates an offline Wi-Fi hotspot on which users are able to connect laptops, tablets, and smartphones to access preloaded educational content, including Wikipedia, TED Talks, Code Academy, Khan Academy, etc. And again, both our resources are both digital and paper, as the Ideas Box does provide up to 300 paperback books within the library module, which we saw in the video. Um, and so this innovative tool support, supports both teachers and students, as it allows teachers to have access to the resources they need to effectively communicate their lesson plans and goals, and students have the ability to interact with the material in new and exciting ways. Through these efforts, we are also reimagining the power of library spaces. So we're transforming what is typically seen as a collection of books into an interactive community hub where people can rally around and support one another in order to build social and economic uh, resilience. So where in the world is the Ideas Box? Um, as we mentioned, Libraries Without Borders has worked in over 27 countries spanning four continents. And you can see here the exact locations of where we have implemented Ideas Boxes in the past and where they are implemented today. And it's important to note that to the far left of the map, we see two dots in the United States. And this is, again, important because uh, we're speaking a lot about the Ideas Box in refugee contexts. And the Ideas Box is not only a tool for refugee populations. So in the United States, we've implemented the Ideas Box in Detroit and in the South Bronx. And again, this is important because these areas are areas that we think of uh, as developed areas that have access to internet, areas that are just kind of like where you and I grow up. But in fact, these are very under-resourced communities, and they need help in terms of supplying their educational content. Um, so we've used the Ideas Box to build community resilience, strengthen community ties, and support local educators there. So now that we uh, hope that you have a clear idea of what the Ideas Box is and a sort of visual image, uh, we wanted to discuss about our current programs and the programs that we have implemented in the past. As I previously mentioned, we implemented our first Ideas Box program in Burundi. And we have a little video to show you about the really positive impact the Ideas Box had in this area and how it's extremely resourceful to those who just don't have any access to information. So I'm going to show you a quick video. <laughs> Ton voisin, c'est un exemple, il avance, il t'a prouvé que quand on veut, on peut viser, que quand on cherche, on peut trouver. Après l'échec, prends-toi en main et redessine ton avenir. Le demi, le demi de la, du lac de, de la Victoria, le demi, c'est combien Je réponds non, des moulons de patience et j'ai fui mon pays suite à l'insécurité. Et comme dit les droits, l'enfant a droit à l'éducation. Nous sommes vraiment à la carence des matériels didactiques. Quand j'avais appris que Mandela était mort, j'avais appris ça après quatre jours. Je me trouve comme si je suis abandonné peut-être même dans, dans une sorte de tombe, mais je ne suis pas en sécurité. C'est vrai. Je réponds au nom de Kanyur Masawa Consolata. Je suis réfugié politique. Je suis séparé de tout. On n'a pas accès à l'information et à la formation. Il n'y a pas d'Internet. 
il n'y a même, même pas d'informatique. Mon nom est Dems Munga Mouloulou. Je fais les atrocités des, des, des groupes rebelles qui, qui se faisaient au Congo. J'aime lire, j'aime aussi écrire. Je suis artiste slammer, je suis chroniqueur également. Nos journées, nous, nous les passons souvent à la maison où on déambule juste dans, dans, dans l'entourage du camp sans rien faire. On a changé de vie juste dans quelques minutes. On, on avait des occupations au Congo qu'on a pris ici. On est isolé du monde. Ce qui nous manque le plus, c'est surtout la culture. Quand on n'a plus rien, la seule chose qu'on ne peut pas vous enlever, c'est le rêve. C'est pour ça que Bibliothèque sans frontières m'a tellement touché, car c'est juste, c'est très juste, car c'est la première et la dernière chose à donner à des gens qui ont tout perdu. Donc, tout d'un coup, il y a des gens qui arrivent, qui tombent du ciel, et qui ont des valises de toutes les couleurs, et qui montent une tente, et à l'intérieur de chaque valise, il y a de la merveille. Nos enfants vont devenir des savants avec ça. On va les comparer avec les enfants de là chez vous. Demain ou après demain, notre pays peut avoir la paix. Ces enfants seront utiles à la société congolaise. La paix, mes deux frères, ça, ça doit. Parce que je, je travaille énormément et je tiens. Je donne les meilleurs de, les meilleurs de moi-même si juste mes, les conditions sont réunies. Thank you everyone for watching that with us. I've watched that more than a dozen times and it uh, always really inspires me to see all these refugees in these camps being uh, provided with information access to education. Um, so Burundi hosts uh, more than 50,000 Congolese refugees and uh, surprisingly, well, it's such a huge number, but 61% of the population is under 18 years old which brings me back to what Kimmy was talking about uh, with the 17 years of uh, the average time that a refugee spends in a refugee camp. Uh, that's a whole generation loss. 61% of 50,000 uh, will not have any basic education uh, and no sort of certificate. Only about 25% of children aged 12 to 17 are enrolled in the camp's middle and high schools. So this really highlights the importance of improving education in refugee camps 
and to increase that access to information. As you saw in the video, um, all these, this whole population, there, there are so many ambitious people in here and they have no access and they have uh, absolutely no resources to go to. So in 2014, we deployed two ideas box kits and within three months, there are already over 24,000 visits and 3,300 registered users, which is a really huge amount, and uh, we're really excited about um, how successful the Ideas Box proved to be. It, it actually improved and increased academic performance by more than 23%. So we're really focused to meet the educational, psychosocial, and informational needs of refugee populations. There are ethnic conflicts that continue in the camp, and we really strive to aid these. Um, the, the community use and interests uh, are continuously on the rise. So this has been a very exciting project uh, through and through, and we're excited to continue it. In addition to our international Ideas Box programs, we also have some domestic Ideas Box programs as well. Um, so the first one we'd like to speak to you about is the program that we launched in the South Bronx, and you can see a photo from that program on the left side of the screen. And this program took place over the summer of 2015, so last year at this time. Uh, and the program was based in Morris Heights, which is part of the nation's poorest congressional district and one of the South Bronx's poorest neighborhoods. And what we did was we sent Ideas Box kits uh, and installed them in laundromats and public parks. So spaces where the community members would already be uh, and allowed them access to educational resources. The Ideas Box was open five afternoons per week and this was really important because it allowed the community, again, a space where they can engage collaboratively and it also supplemented education during the summer months for children who otherwise wouldn't have access to summer programs, summer camps, or summer educational resources. And in Detroit, we uh, implemented the Ideas Box program. And this was uh, after a recent closing of libraries and schools in Detroit. So there was a huge demand for these uh, sort of spaces that provide and increase the access to information and education. Um, although there is internet connection, there's, there aren't uh, many locations in Detroit that are close to educational um, that have public educational resources, and often many children lack after-school educational opportunities. They're very geographically isolated from these. So we worked with our community partners to reimagine educational development, to develop new collaborations, and to engage new users in creating a safe and accessible space for individuals of all ages. Uh, the Ideas Box is really equipped to provide access to high quality educational resources. We really aim to fill the need for more intergenerational spaces in Detroit. It's important to remember that the Ideas Box isn't just for children um, who, have, uh, who lack educational resources. There are also a significant amount of resources for parents, for adults, uh, such as courses to help with resume writing, uh, and other uh, adult educational courses. So that's one of our uh, main aims is to fill that uh, multi-generational gap uh, for spaces in Detroit. And the attendance at each location has increased daily. And through interviews and assessments, the Ideas Box has really generated a really positive response from the users, from parents, from partners, and from interviews, 100% of the users said that they would definitely come back and use the Ideas Box again, and they did. So it's amazing to see such positive responses, uh, particularly in domestic contexts rather than in refugee camps. And that really highlights the need of um, these educational spaces in uh, cities and domestically. So while we did have some Ideas Box programs in the United States, our domestic tool is really the Coombook, which you see pictured in the upper right corner. And the Coombook is essentially the server taken out of the Ideas Box and packaged in its own hard case. The server has, again, has uh, educational content, including Wikipedia, Khan Academy, Code Academy, and TED Talks, 
but the surfer also comes with a large blank space, allowing it to be fully customizable depending on where we implement it and with what local partners. Um, the Coom book is about the size of a dictionary. It's very lightweight and portable, and when packaged as a kit, it's the size of a carry-on suitcase as it includes laptops and or tablets uh, for the communities that we are deploying it to. Um, we truly believe that the Coom book is the digital library of the future as it allows improvisational spaces to become educational uh, communal spaces for all. And again, it creates an offline Wi-Fi hotspot on which users can connect using smartphones, tablets, or computers. Uh, and they have access to preloaded content, including thousands of educational, cultural, and training resources. Uh, the Coom book, if connected to a television or video projector, can also stream videos, which is great for engaging groups through educational activities. And 20 users can connect at one time uh, for a period of five hours before the Coom book has to be recharged. It's important to note that this is an extremely, uh, extremely customizable tool. Uh, we preload materials before the program, but throughout the program, we train those on site uh, how to use the Kumbuk and how to upload content as they go. As long as they're connected to a Wi-Fi network, they can uh, keep uploading different sorts of content onto the Kumbuk. So some of our current domestic Kumba programs include one that we're launching, we have uh, ongoing right now on the White Mountain Apache Reservation in Arizona. And the focus of this Kumba program is to increase tribal historical preservation and build the content of the Fort Apache Museum. So we have currently about 10 Apache children enrolled in our summer program and they are going around using the Coom books and using video cameras to record their tribal history through interviews and conversations with tribal members, tribal leadership, and tribal historians. Um, and this is allowing children to actively participate in the making of their own history, which we find really exciting. Um, we've had really great feedback on this uh, program and we're excited to expand our Kumba programs domestically, particularly on Native American reservations. Uh, currently, we have also learned, uh, launched another Kumba program in Detroit as well. And this is called the Detroit Learning Circles. Uh, Learning Circles is a program that was previously implemented uh, in uh, another area in the United States, and we decided to expand it to Detroit. Um, it's faci we facilitate study groups for learners who want to take online courses together, and uh, we are trying we uh, implement the program in public parks. And we've partnered with P2PU to create a new model of learning circles. So this is the creation of the learning circles is essentially um, an online course that participate, uh, participants can uh, take part in in public parks about uh, two hours a week. And throughout the summer program, they can take this course and earn a certificate at the end. So we're really expanding the access for um, everyone to take part in these courses as it's in, as they are in public areas, uh, specifically in public parks. So it's very access accessible for everyone and they can um, access libraries, internet, or digital tools. So now that you've heard a little bit about our tools and our programs, we'd like to speak a bit about our strategy, how we identify these under-resourced communities and how we engage them in a positive manner. So the first step for that is obviously finding these vulnerable communities, reaching out to them. And we do this in partnership with large international and domestic organizations. We point the problem areas in the United States and suggest ways for members to increase the resilience of educational resources in these areas. From there, we look to find implementing partners, which are typically local organizations or centers, uh, which allow us to incorporate the Ideas Box or Coom Book into their current programs. And this is really important to stress that we incorporate our technology into already established community educational resources. We do not take them over. We do not wipe out all the uh, local educational um, efforts being made on the ground because we understand that local knowledge is the most valuable when it comes to implementing our programs and we really like to value the voices of those who are going to be affected by our programming. So this means that most of our, much of our time is spent building bridges between ed tech, librarians, international policy organizations, local leaders, and human rights groups so that our technology is really thought through and gets at the core needs of the communities. So for example, 
In the case of the White Mountain Apache, which I just spoke to you about as a domestic Kumbuk program, we reached out to the White Mountain Apache Foundation and we formed a partnership with them uh, to best address the needs of their community. So obviously members of the community understand best what their community needs, therefore we really value their input when designing our programs. Uh, additionally, for the Ideas Box, we partner with organizations such as CARE International and the International Refugee Committee to design sustainable programs to really get at the needs of refugees today on the ground, and we also customize them to geographic location. So, for example, for a refugee in the Ivory Coast, we would customize all of our Kumbuk and Ideas Box programming to French, um, so that just makes it much more streamlined, easy for them to use and obviously getting at the core needs of uh, their day-to-day -day educational needs. Um, from there, we engage sponsors. So together with the local partnerships that we have formed, we apply for grant applications, we reach out to sponsors, and we really try to find people that are sympathetic to these causes and understand the real needs uh, at the base of um, our programming. And then we also empower local partners to run and sustain the programming. So once we have our technology on the ground, once we have program facilitators in place, we have local partners ready to engage the community, we like to empower these partners to take over and take responsibility and ownership of the programming. So they're responsible for maintaining, updating, and implementing the programs long after we have sent the technology and trained local implementers. Um, and we monitor very closely the evaluation uh, of these programs to ensure that they are effective and also change and evolve with community needs. Um, but again, we really do like to empower local partners in this process because they are the ones who understand best the needs of their community. Uh, from here, we'd like to speak a bit about our funding strategy. So as we said, Libraries Without Borders works with partners to organize funding strategies. Um, so we applied grant partnership, grant foundations, or funds rather, together. Um, we also are reaching, uh, reaching out to um, donors, trying to apply for grants, and we should be launching a crowdfunding campaign shortly in uh, late summer, early fall, so please look out for that. Share it among your networks if you'd like, um, which should help us really spread the word about our programs and also increase funding. Um, so we are also a 501c3, which is a nonprofit classification, meaning that our team builds partnerships with foundations and corporations to help bring resources, again, to these vulnerable populations. Some of our past partnerships include Google, Sony, the Alexander Soros Foundation, and the Gates Foundation, and these have been really uh, important to us in building and implementing our programs. So the impact of the Ideas Box. Before we launch any program, we really evaluate how uh, impactful the Ideas Box can to uh, fulfill the needs of the community and what we're striving for. So we have four goals that we uh, strive to um, achieve. And firstly, it is capacity building. So by participating in the different workshops and the training sessions that we provide in our projects, uh, librarians, cultural entrepreneurs, uh, disadvantaged populations, all sorts of people can be exposed to these new set of skills. And then the general public is also made aware of these new and innovative technologies, such as the Ideas Box and the Kumbuk, um, because uh, having a server and a hotspot is, is really new, and um, it's a, definitely a, a device that we're very excited about. So by building and transforming and perpetuating libraries, we really guarantee this lifelong access to training and uh, s this help in increasing skills for all generations, for all ages. Our second uh, sort of impact is literacy and education. And we really uh, strive to promote uh, access to reading, to information and knowledge, so that everyone can, uh, who uses the Ideas Box or the Goombook can help increase in adult and child literacy uh, in communities overall. Uh, for example, in the Detroit project, we found that about 4% of 8th graders are at the standard level of uh, math. So this is a really shocking statistic, and we really strive to uh, help increase this, just through improving basic education through the introduction of our new innovative teaching methods.
In addition, we also have a focus on social entrepreneurship. And this loops back to our mission statement, which we really state that we believe that libraries are connectivity centers that empower communities through economic and social development, given the right tools and given the right uh, resources to implement programming. So we empower libraries by helping them ensure economic survival and their ability to grow by accommodating more users. We really want to make them central to communities when it comes to building economic growth. As a result, uh, our libraries that we've worked with have become local economic agents and also increase employment in the areas as they provide training resources, job videos, resume building uh, tools, things of that nature. And again, we really aim to transform them into spaces where people can receive training and learn new skills as this is what ensures their impact in the long run. And finally, we also believe that libraries are spaces uh, that can promote social cohesion as they incorporate collaborative approaches to learning and capacity building. Um, they, our programming with libraries has also allowed for the strengthening of cultural heritage, and this is an essential factor uh, in democratic practice and respect of human rights, um, which you can see through our international interventions and programming. So our support of libraries and cultural structures provides gathering spaces that are open to all allowing people from various social and ethnic backgrounds to come together, work in collaborative spaces, and build intergenerational bonds that allow and uh, perpetuate economic growth in the future. So given all of the programs that we've done, we've also won some notable awards for our work. Um, the first of which that we'd like to highlight is the 2015 Google Impact Challenge, which we're very excited about. Um, because obviously Google is a very innovative uh, company that focuses on technology. And the Ideas Box is really revolutionizing the way that technology is implemented in traditional library spaces and in non-traditional library spaces such as our Ideas Box. Um, we're also very excited about our partnerships with organizations such as Ashoka, which provides us professional um, advice around our programming, helping us to strengthen our current programs and build more resilient programs for the future. We're also partnered with TEDx, as we spoke about previously, which allows us to use their content on our servers uh, for the Kumbuk and for the Ideas Box. We're also members of the Clinton Global Initiative, um, which allows us to increase our impact globally and spread our mission around the world. All right, so we also have some programs in the works currently, the first of which being the Ideas Box for Entrepreneurs, which we're hoping to establish in the Ivory Coast. Essentially what this program does is it allows local community members to lease an Ideas Box and then sell the services of the Ideas Box to other community members. So for example, um, the Ideas Box can kind of transform into an internet cafe-esque space where people can come, use the internet, print off materials, stream videos, etc., all for a user fee uh, for, a, for a specific time period. Um, so let's say like an hour is $3. That would be three more dollars in the pocket of the local community member who is leasing the Ideas Box. And this really helps to grow social entrepreneurship among this community. We also have Ideas Box programs planned for Jordan and Lebanon, which we hope to implement within the coming years. Regarding the Kumbuk, we have uh, a lot of potential plans that we've been working on. Uh, following the White Mountain Apache, we would love to, we are hoping to expand our programming on other Native American reservations because there is a huge need for um, educational resources and to help support education in those areas. We also have been uh, planning programs for prisons. Um, Many, uh, many people don't know, but internet access is forbidden in all prisons, uh, naturally for security reasons. However, this means that uh, prisoners don't have any access to education. And so when they re-enter society, there are extremely high reincarceration rates as a lot of them have no uh, educational backgrounds, no basic skills, um, cannot find employment. So we really aim to uh, help the prisoners in taking uh, online courses so they can develop their skills and we believe that this will have a huge impact on the reincarceration rates and significantly reduce them. Furthermore, we have other planned programs for other under-resourced communities domestically in the states. 
such as Colorado, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And we really strive to focus on those areas that are most under-resourced, have very scarce internet connection, or are geographically, uh, geographically um, isolated from libraries or community spaces. And also those in which uh, literacy rates, um, numeracy rates are significantly lower than the US standard level. So how can you get involved? Well, firstly, you can support our programs. Uh, we'd love for you to check out our websites, uh, website, uh, libraryswithoutborders.org, and feel free to donate. Um, we also uh, support volunteers. We'd love for you to stay informed as well. We're very active on our Facebook page, Libraries Without Borders, and our Twitter, which is LWB on the web. And we love to answer questions, so you can always tweet at us or post on our wall uh, with any questions, and we'll answer uh, very quickly. We're very efficient. <laughs> and um, please keep an eye out for all our crowdfunding campaign, uh, our crowdfunding campaign uh, that's set to launch in late summer slash early fall. Uh, so you can help support our domestic and international programs. Uh, we hope that you're inspired by what we've done so far, and we're really enthusiastic to expand our programs to more countries uh, globally and to more continents. Uh, we're very excited about our innovations and what impact it can have on communities. In addition, we're calling librarians to engage with us uh, through our Librarian Board of Advisors. So if you're a trained librarian with a degree in library sciences, interested in influencing developmental aid, or looking to give back to under-resourced communities in your area, and you'd like to play a role in shaping Libraries Without Borders future domestic programming, we ask that you send a resume or a CV to admin at libraryswithoutborders.org, which you can see on the screen, to apply for our Librarian Board of Advisors. Um, so again, this is going to be a board of advisors aimed at really shaping Libraries Without Borders programs, policies, and ways in which we implement uh, our technology. So please, if you're interested, reach out to us. We would love to hear back from you. And um, that is a new and exciting initiative that we are undertaking. So that's about all from us today. Uh, please don't be shy with any questions that you may have about the program, about the Librarian Board of Advisors, about ways to get involved, uh, and about our technology. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Paloma and Kimmy. That was that was great. I've I didn't know much about Libraries Without Borders until um, actually last year at our annual um, state library conference here. Um, uh, one of our Omaha Public Library staff had done a presentation about it. Um, that uh, talking about it there, and I had seen it there, and thought it would be great to share it with more people, but. Um, wouldn't it weren't able to attend our conference um, it is definitely very inspiring and I, when I first heard about the ideas box too I wasn't exactly sure what it was and I watched that video <clears throat> the one of them the four staff people opening it up and sh setting it up and yeah, yeah, it was just amazed and stunned and thought how how awesome that is that should be everywhere <laughs> well, thank you. That's it's amazing. just such a small thing and so much i mean 300 actual books in that little box right that is we're very lucky to um, work with philip stark and unhcr uh, to help design it yes um, i've read about that that uh, having someone who could figure out how do you um efficiently fit everything into something as small mm -hmm. as possible for transport <laughs> um yeah yeah, it makes me, you know, I just moved recently to a new house, and I know we have more than 300. I wish I had somebody <laughs> to help me move all those books that I had. Um, yeah, being a librarian, they they, 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 they add up. Um, if anybody does have any questions, please do type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface, and we can have Paloma and Kimmy answer them for you now. Um, one thing I was actually very much impressed with is the whole... Um, I mean, having the resources and everything there and the books and the, and the classes is great. But the fact that the, the ideas box comes with its own power and supply and access to Internet, that is very how, – how is that pulled off, I guess? Um, like logistically, how does, how does that actually work? Sure. So um, I don't – Paloma, you can feel free to jump in here at any point. I don't know the specifics of the design of the ideas box, unfortunately. Um, but we do know that it is, like you said, it is um, completely autonomous in terms of a power source. 
and it does have its offline server, which provides um, ah, nice. okay. Wi-Fi connection. So it is offline. That's good. It does not create an internet uh, Wi-Fi hotspot, an active oh. live Wi-Fi hotspot in the area, mm -hmm. but it does allow offline connection to preloaded cached websites and educational resources. Okay. Well, that's that's nice for what you need in those areas that don't have access to that at all. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. Um, but the Coom box, that does have, the that's the Wi-Fi hotspot one. Yeah, so, so that's it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, so the Coom book is incorporated into the Ideas bots. And yes, so essentially what Kimmy had said, it's a server and you preload uh, materials onto it. We are partnered with Khan Academy. We have Code Academy. We can put TED Talks, as previously mentioned. Um, and a variety, uh, a series of other uh, educational resources. We are also um, potentially hoping to work in Ecuador, so uh, Latin American, uh, Latin America countries as well. We can um, South American countries mm -hmm. we can work with as well and provide uh, Spanish-focused resources. Mm -hmm. um, so there's really endless possibilities with the Coom book and in providing uh, educational resources for a variety of languages and a variety of populations. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and as Paloma said, that is the same server that is found in the Ideas box. Mm -hmm. So again, it does not create a live Wi-Fi internet connection, but it does have an offline server hotspot connection to all of the preloaded content. Nice. And you said that's um, customizable too, so if they locally wanted to put something else on there, they would be yeah, able so to modify it to something that's specific to their community? Right, so before we implement the program, we make sure to communicate and collaborate with the community to fit their needs and what resources they want on it. So they, um, they specify which resources would be most beneficial for the community. So we preloaded before. Mm -hmm. However, also, when we've implemented it, we also help train the facilitators on how to use the Kumbuk and how to upload content on site while they're there. However, they do need to be connected to internet to mm -hmm. uh, upload content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's nice. great about that too is that it's customizable around themes, meaning that, for example, if we're using it in a classroom setting, uh, if a teacher wants to have a biology lesson, they can customize it for that particular lesson using biology videos, uh, articles from Wikipedia, TED Talks, things of that nature. Um, so it can really change to adapt on a day-to-day, -day, hour by hour basis. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, we do have one question, and I was wondering about this too. Um, Coom book, where does that name come from? Coom. Um, <laughs> That's something I, I can figure out, like an acronym for something? or. <laughs> well, actually, we're in the process of changing the name, um, oh. but this was a temporary name because it, Coom book, um, Kumbuka means uh, to remember in Swahili. Oh, nice. So, okay. Yes, that's where it originated from. However, this is a, a temporary name, and we are hoping to change it to something a little bit more universal uh, because, well, many people don't know Swahili. So, and, and in like uh, this situation, having to explain it to people is there, right. there's something I should know right. about that it's called that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is that's where um, the, the name originated. Uh, however, it's not going to be uh, like uh, like that uh, like that per like that permanent. Okay. All right, any other questions uh, from the audience? Nobody typed in anything more than that. <laughs> Anybody want to – you guys were very – I kept writing down questions I wanted to ask, and you, you kept answering them, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, how to contact you to get – to, like if, if something – if someone um, in the United States wanted to reach out to you to actually have either Library Box or Coom Book in their area. Um, you said there's ways to reach out to – just Absolutely. contact you guys online. Yes. So um, our web, we would just ask that you write us an email or uh, write us a Facebook message. So again, our Facebook page is called Libraries Without Borders. Um, it's like an official page. So when you type mm -hmm. that in, you should see the little um, check mark that it means that it's an official yeah, page. Blue check, yeah. us, exactly. So you can send us messages there. Uh, and then also our email is admin. So a D M I N at libraries without borders dot org. Mm -hmm. um, so you can shoot us an email, but any questions you may have, trying to get in contact again to bring our technology to specific areas, and we're pretty responsive about that. Yeah, I, I, see I think that. what's also oh, 
<laughs> so I see that on your, on your Facebook page, yeah, that there's, um, yeah. you're very active and posting new things on there all the time, so definitely try to go. And yeah. um, <laughs> also, just a little reminder, uh, we are in partnership with Riverhead Books, and they uh, help support us in launching a, uh, camp, a fundraising initiative in which if you uh, donate $250 to us, you can get a little figurine of your favorite author, uh, such as Khaled Osini. And that is a uh, fundraising initiative is actually finishing tomorrow. So if you uh, are very um, into your authors and mm -hmm. would love to donate, that would be greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, finishing tomorrow. So we've got a lot of support from that. Mm -hmm. um, and we really appreciate all the help that Riverhead Books has uh, provided for us. Mm -hmm. That's very, yeah, that is very, people love their little things and, and I've got a lot of those <laughs> yeah. little They're various statues and things on my desk of various, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a really successful initiative and we really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Yeah. Um, just, I, no, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, just going back uh, to how you can um, get the Coom book or the ideas box. We just want to em uh, emphasize as an organization, we, um, we really strive to work with implementing partners in producing programs. So we don't just uh, drop off materials. We aim to create sustainable programs that can uh, last over a significant amount of time. And we help support the implementing partners uh, in creating this program. So we really don't just drop off the materials, but we um, we support them and we collaborate with the partners. Um, however, once the program is implemented, we ensure that the partner can sustain this program and we pass on the responsibility onto them. So yes, that's a bit about how we work and um, we, how we want to create uh, a very lasting change and uh, um, an economic and social development. So, yes. mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Well, we're just about hitting 11 a.m. So um, just another minute left, 11 a.m. Central Time. So I think um, since nobody seems to have any urgent questions for you at the moment, um, we will wrap it up for today. Um, I would, as you guys said, um, about this, uh, the um, Library Board of Advisors, the Librarian Board of Advisors sounds very interesting. And I hope a lot of my colleagues will um, reach out to you guys to try and um, um, participate in that. And I will definitely be sharing it in all the groups that I, I am in online to get people to know hey, about you. what you guys are doing there. Thank you. We appreciate that. Get some good um, resumes that come in. I know there's a lot of people that are very interested in anything like this and, and would want to be involved in it. So, Great. all right. So, yeah, I think we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you so much, Paloma and Kimmy. This was great. Um, this is very inspiring. And just some of the information, you know, it is sad things that are happening out there. Um, they're, you know, heart wrenching. Um, but I'm glad that you guys are there doing this this part of this work um, of, to help some of these people in these situations, both um, abroad and especially here now in the U.S. I know we have Indian reservations here in Nebraska and the Indian groups that would definitely be in, interested in what you're doing as well. So maybe we'll get some of them contacting you as well. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much for having us on today. We really appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So, yes, that will wrap it up for today's show. I'm going to pull back presenter control to my screen. Great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. And um, the show has been recorded, is being recorded as we speak, um, and will be available later today. I've been bookmarking a lot of the sites that you've mentioned there, your site, the Coom Book site. Um, as you can see, I've got here, this is the those uh, – 3D Great. models that you can get. I found the site for that by Googling it. <laughs> the Riverhead books okay. there. Um, oh, yes. They're pretty cool. They look like almost like little Lego heads, actually, but I see the yeah, 3D printed, do. which is neat. Yeah. <laughs> um, so all of that will be available to you as well. And um, the PowerPoint presentation, um, oh, will you guys send that to me so I can share that with people if they want to watch that later? Of course. Okay. Cool. We'll have that as well, I'm there later. Um, it will be here on our Encompass Live website. Um, luckily, Encompass Live, um, if you just Google Encompass Live or use any of your search engines for that, uh, so far nobody has else has called anything that, so we come up first in your results. Awesome. <laughs> um, our recordings are here on our main page. Right underneath our upcoming shows is an archived Encompass Live sessions link. So um, later this afternoon, the one for today will be on here, and like our previous one, you'll have a link to the recording, a link to the presentation, and to the URLs in the um, um, delicious account that we have here and I'll email all of you guys to let you know when that's available um, 
and like I said, later this afternoon depends on how quickly everything processes. <laughs> um, so that wraps it up for today. I hope you join us for next week's show when our topic is uh, cataloging. Cataloging is always a very popular topic here on the show. Uh, making your catalog work for your community, how to develop local cataloging standards. Um, this is something that a lot of, many libraries do just a lot of copy cataloging, just taking mark records or mark records as they are to put into their local online catalogs. But there's a lot of things you can do to make things specific to your organization or that you need to do. Um, to do that. Uh, we will have Emily Nimsikant who is from our University of Nebraska College of Law Library here, Schmidt Law Library, and she'll be on the, the show with us next week to talk about that. So definitely log in, for, um, sign up for that. And any of our other shows coming up here, um, I've got dates going into August. I um, have more being added as I get things confirmed and, and finalized with everyone. So keep an eye on our website here for more upcoming shows being posted. Also, we are also on Facebook. So if you are a big Facebook user, please do pop over to our Facebook page and give us a like. I post reminders. Um, here's one from this morning, reminding people they can log in on the fly to our show. When our recordings are available, I post information about that on here. So if you are a big user on Facebook, please do go right ahead over there and um, give us a like. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning's show. Thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.